Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Wow, good looking, good looking early morning crowd this morning. It seems like every week um, we have more and more of our church family coming back to in-person gatherings, and it's so good to so good to see some faces I haven't seen in a while, and also see some new faces. Uh, if you're if you're maybe with us today for the first time, I just want to say on behalf of Neighborhood Church, welcome, welcome. We're glad you chose to come and, and worship with us today. We're a church that uh, we want to help people find Jesus. Uh, to be a, a really, really good neighbor and to help, help you to win your neighborhood. Uh, that's what we're all about here. And I hope that you have come this morning anticipating something from the Lord, um, that you didn't just come to church this morning just because it's what we do in the South. We watch college football on Saturday and we go to church on Sunday. But I hope that you came to church and that you come every single week uh, anticipating an encounter uh, with the Lord, with, with our, our Heavenly Father, uh, through His people, through our fellowship, through being together, uh, through His Word, by His Holy Spirit, uh, so many different ways that, that, that God ministers to us as His kids, as His children. So I hope you came anticipating something from Him today, because I believe that God wants to really, really speak to us and minister to us today. Before we jump into to our message this morning, um, I just want to make a couple of add-on an announcements here just to, to remind you. Uh, these aren't, weren't in the video, but we've got three, three really great opportunities that I think um, you would benefit from this morning, depending on where you're at and what you're, what you're needing in your life right now. But uh, on Wednesday nights, uh, our Walk Through the Bible group has started back up, uh, took the summer off, and has started meeting again here at the church on Wednesday nights at 6.30, just going through the Bible, scripture after scripture together, uh, uh, studying, uh, walking through every book of the Bible together. So encourage you to come out and, and, and be a part of that on Wednesday nights. Um, Prayer Works. Prayer Works is a brand new group that has started this past week on Thursday nights. Uh, particularly for, for folks that you're, you're having some type of struggle in your life right now. Maybe you need some type of special touch from God. Maybe it's, maybe it's healing that you need in your body, in, in your life in some way. Maybe it's something that you're struggling with, an addiction. Maybe there's depression. Could be um, you're hurting because there's been a loss in your life. Could be anything. This group is coming together on Thursday nights um, simply to uh, pray for one another, to share one another's burdens, as the Bible says, and to pray for one another so that you may be healed. Um, so I encourage you to come be a part of that. And then lastly, our men's fraternity group will start meeting next Sunday on October the 3rd during the 1030 service. That means you can come to, guys, you can come to the 9 o'clock service like you are now and stay at 1030. I promise you, if you're married, your spouse will be glad you did um, because this is a, a men's, men's fraternity group that is going to be studying for, about, for six or eight weeks on what authentic manhood really looks like, what it looks like to be a, a true godly man in the day and time that we live in. So I encourage you, reach out. Michael Bryant will be leading this group. Uh, there's his contact on the screen. Would you stand with me? I want to ask you to stand. We do this every week just to honor and reverence God's Word. Um, I want to read a passage of Scripture to you this morning, and, and I, I'm just going to kind of wrap up um, the series that we've been in that we've just been, I've just been calling My Prayer for You. Uh, and for several weeks now, we have been um, just looking at different passages of Scripture um, that, that have really, really hit home with me recently, um, and, and these passages of Scripture have become a prayer that I have for you, the people of, of Neighborhood Church and the people of this community. Um, so I want to share another one with you today that starts off this morning with a, another one of those tough, tough passages of Scripture. Um, so if you'll follow along with me, I'm going to read to you this morning, I think think this is on the screen. This one we may not have. It's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. If we don't have it, just listen up. The Bible said this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Say terrible times. Terrible. Say last days. last days. Sound familiar? <laughs> Sound um, like maybe we can relate. There will be terrible times in the last days. I want you to listen to the following lines. If any of it sounds even remotely familiar with the day and time that we live in, 
<clears throat> verse 2 says, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. That last phrase is the phrase I want us to key in on this morning. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. We're going to expound upon that this morning. What, what, what does that even mean? A form of godliness but denying its, its power. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you so much today. We just thank you for the opportunity we have to come and to be in your house together with one another. God, we, we love you so much. We've come for you and for you alone today. I pray that you would just remove me from this stage, from this platform, God, that you would speak today clearly from your word today. Speak to us through your Holy Spirit today. Penetrate our hearts and our minds. And Father, may we leave here different today because we've been in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. You may be seated. You may be seated, a form of godliness, but denying its power. I shared with you last, well, not last week, last week um, you didn't let me preach, and I just want to say, by the way, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, thank you to our staff. Um, thank you to all of you for the way that you just showed your love and appreciation to Polly and I last week uh, on, on a very special day. We're so grateful and humbled, and I say this all the time because I mean it. It's the greatest honor of my life, of our lives, to be your pastors. So thank you. But I um, shared with you recently that uh, a recent Gallup poll said, stated that 94% of Americans uh, claim to believe in God. 94% of Americans claim to believe in God. But we also kind of established that most of us would agree that 94% of Americans uh, do not live their lives in obedience to God, that 94% of Americans do not live their lives conforming to the image of his son, Jesus Christ, in obedience to his word, that 94% of Americans may believe in God, but many, of, many Americans who, who claim to believe in God continue to live however they want to live. I believe in God, but I'm still just going to live my life how I want to live it, whether it comes to just a certain area, certain things, um, or whether it's just in general. Um, I think this takes us back to the end of that passage that people would have a form of godliness, but denying its power. What does that mean? Well, the power of God if we truly believe God and if we truly are living our lives being conformed by his, if we truly, truly believe the, me, the, the, the gospel message of Jesus Christ, that message, according to scripture, has the power to save and it has the power to change and to transform our lives. And so, so people that have a form of godliness but are denying its power are these people who, who, who believe in God, but they don't fear him enough to change their lives, denying his power. They believe in God, but I'm not going to believe in God to the extent where I'm going to go overboard and actually have to change anything about the way I do life and live my life. I'm going to believe, but I'm not. I'm going to have a form of godliness, but that's it. A form, but I'm going to deny its power to change my life. 94% of Americans say that they believe in God. question I have for us this morning is this. Where is the fear of God today? Where, where is the fear of God in, in our world, particularly in this country, maybe even in the lives of many believers today who, who believe in God, take on a form of godliness, but I'm, I'm going to deny it to the extent that it has any power to actually bring about change or transformation in my life. Where is the, the fear of God today? 
Pastor, I didn't think we're supposed to fear. The Bible says God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind. I would submit to you today that there are some very healthy types of fear. As a matter of fact, one that we're going to look at this morning, I would say, is an exceptional fear, and it's a fear of God. So when I was, year, years ago, when I was younger growing up, um, I love ice cream, and, and, and years ago, some of you that are my age or older, you'll remember this, but pretty much we had three flavors to choose from. You had chocolate, vanilla, and thank you very much. Some of you are at least my age. Um, that was it, believe it or not. I mean, it was pretty, you know, pretty limited what our choices were, chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry, and then Baskin-Robbins came along. Baskin-Robbins came along and offered us how many flavors? 31 flavors. Customize your ice cream. I mean, remember you could go into any Baskin Robbins and you could get the little pink little spoon and you could sample all 31 flavors of ice cream and you could walk out of Baskin Robbins completely full and never have ordered a thing. 31 flavors of ice cream. Get any kind, anything imagined, flavors we never even imagined. Some of them were even gross, but, but we began to have this kind of customized mentality here in America that I want, so I want it different, I want it my way, I want it special. It used to be the same thing with coffee. If you wanted a good cup of coffee, what did you do? You, you, you made either a cup of, of regular coffee or decaf coffee, uh, a, a pot of it, before you left your house. And that's what you had. You had some black coffee with maybe some cream or sugar, and it was either regular or decaf. And then, um, uh, and then something changed. This, this company called Starbucks came along, and all of a sudden, man, you can have coffee customized any way that you want it. You can have, you know, roll up to Starbucks at any Starbucks in the world and, and, and say, hey, you know, I want, a, I want a cup of coffee. What would you like? You know, I'll have a, a tall, skinny Ariana Grande uh, decaf, low whip, um, whatever, you know, calf milk, I don't know. Uh, any way you want it, any name you want it. Can I get a name for that? Yes. Glad you asked. Rico. Suave. That's my name today. Customized cup of coffee any way you want it. In more modern times, listen, today you can get your sneakers. You can get your, you can get your kicks customized. You can go online at Nike or Adidas and customize your tennis shoes. If, if you really are in love with yourself, you can get a customized bobblehead with your head on it bobbling, sitting on your dashboard. Um, so many different things today we, we, we customize. Listen, you can, if, if you're into soft drinks and drinks and, and all kind of combinations, Sonic, are you aware that Sonic offers 3.5 million different combinations of drinks at Sonic? Slushies, I'm talking all the, all the different combinations, 3.5 million different combinations of beverages that you can get at Sonic, customized just for you. Listen, you can get a customized boyfriend or girlfriend today at Match.com. Just about any way you want it. Man, I'll take, yeah, yeah, I'll, I need a, you need a boyfriend? You can go on Match.com. I'll take a, I'll take a, I'd, I'd really like a six foot two, maybe six foot three, tall, dark, and handsome. No, let's make it blonde uh, with long, wavy hair who loves to write poetry and, uh, and feeds the homeless while riding horseback, and I'd like him Friday around three o'clock. Customize your boyfriend, customize your girlfriend, uh, anything you want. And here's, here's what's sad. Sadly, it feels like we've moved into an era of customized Christianity as well. God has created us in his image, and we're going to return the favor by creating our God in our own image. Customize, a customized Christianity where we want his love but we don't want his truth. We want his grace, but we don't want his wrath. We want the blessings of God in our lives, but we don't want to have to be obedient to God. There's parts of the Bible that, that we really love. Man, I, I love the part of the Bible that says that God wants to, to bless me and to prosper me, and he has a plan for me and a future for me and plans not to harm me. But that whole, you know, sexual purity thing, I mean, come on, that's so outdated. I mean, that goes all the way back to the Bible. Exactly.
I love that part that says that God works all things to the good of those who love him and that are called according to his purposes. I, I love that he wants to bless me coming in and bless me going out, but don't ask for my money. Don't ask me to trust God with that. I'm, I'm not going to tithe. I mean, are you serious? I mean, that's mine. Again, that, I mean, that goes back to the Bible, right? I mean, that's, that's Old Testament. I mean, that's under the law, right? We're, we don't live under the law anymore. You're right, we don't. But tithing actually predates the law. And Jesus himself said, you should tithe. But we like to customize and pick and choose and create our own form of Christianity, our own version of following God. Customized Christianity is people who we believe in God, but I believe with all my heart we don't fear him. Because when we fear God, we're going to talk about what that means in a second. When we fear God, it prompts us to, to change some things, even if it's something we don't want to change when we have a healthy fear of God. David was actually writing about the sinfulness of mankind in this next passage. He was writing about the sinfulness of mankind, and David, David later, his, his own eyes were even open to his own sinfulness, just how bad he was. But listen to what David had to say in Psalm 36. He said, sin whispers to the wicked deep within their hearts. They have no fear of God to restrain them. In their blind conceit, they cannot see how wicked they really are. What does sin say when sin whispers deep within our heart? I'll tell you what sin usually says. Sin usually says, ah, go ahead. You're not hurting anybody. Uh, go ahead. I mean, it's okay to believe in God, but you don't need to just go overboard with it. I mean, that's old, that's old school stuff. I mean, we live in a different day, a different day. It's okay. You're not hurting anybody. I mean, God created you, you, he, God's going to understand. He's going to forgive you anyway. Sin whispers deep inside of our heart. And the Bible says that in our blind conceit, we cannot see how wicked we are. They have no fear of God. It's the fear of God that restrains us. It's the fear of God that says, no, I'm not going to look at that. It's the fear of God that says, no, I'm not going to engage in that kind of conversation. It's the fear of God that says, no, I'm not going to gossip about that person. That, 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 that's not Christ-like. It's the fear of God that restrains us and that stops us. And the Bible says that these people, they had no fear of God, so they basically lived with a form of godliness, denying his power, not allowing it to change anything about how they live their lives. It's a fear of God without changing anything. question this morning. What if this verse is talking to us? What if this verse is talking to me? What if this verse is, is talking to you? What if we have no fear of God to restrain us? What if we are blind to our own self-centeredness, to our own sinfulness, and we can't even see just how far from God we really are. In their blind conceit, they cannot see how wicked they really are. I would say, and maybe, 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 maybe you can relate to this, I would say that years ago, the pendulum swung way over here in many of our churches. That years ago, we were way on this end of the pendulum where everything was hellfire and brimstone. I mean, hey, anybody besides me, ever, when you were young, go, go to bed scared to death, that, that there was something that you forgot to ask forgiveness about, that, that, that God was coming back and, and mom and dad were going to be gone when you woke up and you were going straight to hell. <laughs> God never intended for us to live that way. Maybe there was a time when the pendulum swung way over here to this side, to, to legalism, but I believe in more recent times, the pendulum has swung way over to this side. 
to where so many believers, so many followers of Jesus grew up way on this side of the pendulum, being beat over the head with a hammer for so many years of their lives, scared to death that God was this, this cosmic cop that was going to write them a ticket, that, that the pendulum swung way to this side where it's like, you know, we're kind of tired of that, and we looked for a much easier gospel light type of message. Well, I don't want to feel, you know, bad. I don't want to feel guilty. I don't want to hear how, how bad things are in the world. I don't want to hear about my sin. I, I want to come over here where it's much more comfortable in easy light Christianity. And we swung way to this side where pretty much it's okay. God gets it. He gets you. He's going to forgive you anyway. He's a big enough God. Don't worry about it. I would submit to you that both of those are unhealthy even dangerous. Listen, the, the truth of God is, is real and it's true, but it's incomplete by itself. The, the, the love of God is true and it's real, but it's incomplete. The grace of God, but without itself, the by, by itself. The Bible says that when Jesus came, he came full of grace and truth. He, came, he was full of grace, and you can't have one without the other. You can't, you can't just be all about the grace of God without the truth of God, and you can't just be all about, by God, the Bible says about the truth of God without it also extending the same grace of God that he's extended to you and me. It's a dangerous place to be on either end of those, those, those spectrums. So what in the world is the fear of God? What are we talking about when we say fear of God? This, I want to give you just my definition. Um, it, it may not be perfect, but this is what I mean by the fear of God. Where is the fear of God today that compels us, that restrains us from certain things in this life and compels us to, to do other things in this life? Where is the fear of God? Fear of God, here's my working definition. To fear God is to love him deeply to respect him fully, and to obey him completely. When you live your life this way, then where you have a deep love for God, where you have a a full respect for him, and you you strive to obey him completely, not not half-hearted obedience, not delayed obedience, but a swift, yes, this is what you would have me to do. Yes, this is what the, the word of God says, so this is what I'm going to do. When you live this way, to me, you have a healthy fear of God. A healthy fear to love him deeply, to respect him fully, to obey him completely. To, to kind of put it in, 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 in human terms, I want to I describe it like this. Years ago, Polly and I had the opportunity, the privilege, incredible privilege to serve under, under one of the greatest men of God that I know. His name is Mitch Quarter, Pastor Mitch. Pastor Mitch hired Polly and I to be his youth pastors when we were just kids just about, and, 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 and brought us to Plant City, Florida, where we ended up serving that church for 16 years. And Pastor Mitch was an amazing man of God. And, and, and this man of God, he, he took me under his arm, and he, he invested in me, and he spent time with me. And he would, he would, he would, he would take me to funerals that he was, uh, he, he was conducting. He would take me to hospitals with him when he would go to pray for someone that was sick. He would take me to a member's home when there was a, an issue that needed to be dealt with. And he would take me under his arm, and he would call me over across the hall to his office occasionally, and he would, he would say, now, Tori, here's, here's what's going on. What do you think? And then I would tell him what I think, and then he'd say, well, here's, here's why that's not right. You know, he, he would help me, and he, would, he invested in me, and he took me under his, under his arm, and he, he loved me, and I had a deep, listen, I had a deep love for Pastor Quarter because of who he is, because of the man that he was to me, but I also had a very deep honoring fear and respect for him because I, I respect the, the position, the office of pastor. And so I had a deep love for this man because of who he was to me personally, but I also had a very healthy respect for this man and and, and, and a godly fear for this man because of the way I saw God use this man and speak through this man and the anointing of God that was on his life. And I had a healthy respect for the office of pastor. And so you you take that, you take that and and you put God into that equation and we have to just multiply it by a gazillion. 
because of who God is and because of everything that God has done for us, that he, that he sent his son to die for us when we were in our sins, when we did not deserve it, he gave us his son Jesus to be sacrificed, to die for us. I love God because of who he is, but I also have a, a deep respect for the God who is a consuming fire. I love him because he's a loving God that loved me enough to sacrifice everything for me, a sinner, but I respect him because he is, he is a God of judgment and of righteousness and a holy God, and I have a fear for him because, because one day all of us, myself included, will stand before him in judgment. So I have a deep love for God, but I also have a healthy healthy, exceptional fear of God Almighty that restrains me and compels me into action at the same time. What has happened to the fear of God in this country? What has happened to the fear of God in, in the lives of so many believers Listen, to fear God is not a bad thing. I don't want to, I don't want, I don't want to serve a God that I've got to be afraid of. That's, that's not what we're talking about. To fear God is not a bad thing. To fear God is a righteous thing. It's a beautiful thing filled with promises and blessings. I just want to read a few of them to you. The Bible is filled with the promises and blessings of God that come from a fear of God. Here's here's just three of them. Proverbs 9.10 says, the fear of the Lord is what? Say it out loud. It's the beginning of wisdom. Where does wisdom start? The Bible says, by fearing God. You need wisdom for your life. You want wisdom in your life to make good decisions, to know how to raise your children, to know how to, how to, how to heal your marriage. You need, you need wisdom to know how to run your business. You need wisdom in this life to, to better your, anything you need. You need wisdom. It starts by fearing God himself. Allowing the the love and the respect that you have and the fear of God that you have to restrain you from things and to compel you to to step out and obey God. Proverbs 14 and 27 says, the fear of the Lord is what? One more time. It is the the fountain of life. It's It's like life, when you fear God, life just gushes out of you. That's how I picture that. When you have a healthy love and respect and fear of God, everything just gushes out from there. It's a fountain of life. It takes you out of that which destroys you and brings you into the blessings that God has for you. In Proverbs 22 and 4, it says, True humility, and here it is again, fear of the Lord leads to riches and honor and long life. What is the fear of God? It's a good thing. It leads to blessings. And here's the thing. When I fear God, I will surrender my life to God. And when I'm surrendered to God, I'll obey God. When I fear God, I surrender to God. When I'm surrendered to God, I want to obey God. One of the greatest stories in all the scripture about the fear of God is found in Genesis chapter 22. When Abraham, God asked of Abraham, who, whose greatest desire was to have a son. His greatest desire was to have a son. God, give me a son, give me a son, give me a son. For decade after decade after decade after decade, Abraham wanted a son, and all of a sudden, he gets a son. God gives him a son. And Isaac, Isaac is, is now this, this, this son that had been, had been the object of, 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 of Isaac's prayers and, and the greatest earthly desire he'd ever had. God gives this to him. He gives us his son, Isaac. And Isaac is now growing up. He's a young man. And God asked I, Abraham to do something. He asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, the only son, the object of his, his desire, the, the greatest human love that Abraham has for anything is for this son. And God God says, sacrifice him for me. And so Abraham, because he loves God, Abraham, because he has such a respect for God, Abraham, because he fears God, he surrenders to God and obeys God. 
And you know what he does? He takes his son, his, the son that, that he loves more than anything. He takes him up a mountain, ties him to an altar, and he raises a knife, a dagger above. And, 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 and thankfully, at the last second, an angel of the Lord appears and he stops Abraham. And listen to what he says to Abraham in Genesis 22. He said, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Watch what he says. Now I know that you fear God. Now I know that you fear God. Why? Because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Now I know that you fear God because you've held nothing back. Whatever it is that you love in this life that you hold on to, the, th- the thing you love to do, the relationship that's not good, whatever it is, now I know that you fear me because you've even given me that. You've held nothing back from me. The greatest evidence of the fear of God is total surrendered, total surrender followed by complete obedience. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, keep my commands. Not partial obedience, not delayed obedience, quick, immediate. Yes, God, I trust you. Therefore, I will do whatever you ask of me. See, the fear of God, it's it's an ongoing, continual posturing of our heart that, that moves me to choose over and over again to obey God even if I want to do something else. It's a continual posturing of my heart. If this is how I'm going to live today, and this is how I'm going to live this afternoon, and this is how I'm going to live tonight, and this is how I'm going to live tomorrow. A continual posturing of my heart that moves me to choose over and over again to obey God even when I want to do something else. Not a customized Christianity. I'll take this part of God because I like it. I'll take that part of God because it feels good to me. Ah, Not that one because I don't really care for that. Uh, It's not a customized Christianity. Tragically, we see so much of that today. Customized Christianity. I'll serve you, God, but I'm still going to sleep with my boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, because I mean, you know, that's just kind of old school. You know, I'll serve you, God. I believe in you, God, but I'm not going to stop watching porn. I mean, that's just kind of my way of dealing with the stresses of this life. I'll follow you, God, but don't expect me to start tithing and supporting you, you know, financially. I mean, if you're God, you don't need my money anyway, right? I mean, on and on and on. I don't expect me to surrender every area of my life. In other words, I believe in you, God, but I don't fear you one bit. That's what we say when we live our lives that way. And I would say to you this morning that if this is you, this is dangerous. This is dangerous. You believe in God, but you have no fear of Him. And this is a modern day tragedy that is passing off for Christianity today, when in reality, it is something far different from truly being a disciple of Christ. Getting ready to close with this. This brings us to a point of application. The question I want to ask you is this this morning. In what area of your life are you not fearing and obeying God? In what area of your life are you withholding? In what area of your life are you not fully surrendered? Are you not fearing God because you continue to do it even though you know you shouldn't? Because you're, refri- you're, you're, you're continuing to refuse even though you know you should. In what area of your life are you withholding from God? Are you not fearing Him and not obeying Him? And the second question is this. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? I believe with all my heart that God is working in some hearts this morning. 
and that he's going to continue to work in our hearts this morning. That you want to love him. And deep down when you think about who he is, you do respect him. And because you love him and respect him, that you will fear him. And because you will fear him, you will obey him. Now, I don't know what this is going to look like for you. It's going to look different for everybody in the room. You know what the Holy Spirit's speaking to you about in this moment. There's probably somebody, somebody either here today in one of our services or watching online somewhere who you're living with your boyfriend or girlfriend. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, and he's saying, you know what? It's time to, number one, either move out or get married. It's time, it's time enough playing games with it. Because you love God, because you respect God, because you fear God, you want to honor God by obeying God. And there's nobody greater that you want to honor, that you want to please, than him. Maybe you're living with an unconfessed sin that you just continue to hide, you just continue to let linger and dwell, and God's going to speak to you this morning. God's going to speak to you this morning about confessing that sin first to him and then to other people, to someone else. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you might be healed. And you're going to say enough's enough. God, I love you enough. I have a great enough fear for you that I'm not going to worry about what this may cost me to go public with it or to confess it to a friend. I just want to be free of it. And I want to live in obedience to you. Maybe this morning you're dating a person that you know is not God's best for you. Maybe you're dating someone this morning that you know is not God's best best for you and you have rationalized it, you have explained it away, you've said, oh, I'm going to be a good influence on them and and he's all this and she's all that. Listen, God never intended for you to play the field as a mission field. God intended for you to live your life wholly committed to him and to pray for and to wait for the godly person that can pair up with you so that the the two of you can do more for the kingdom of God and his glory than, than you ever dreamed or imagined. And some of you are gonna break up with that person because it's the right thing to do because you have a love for God and a respect for God and a fear of God that you only want his will for your life. For, some, for somebody, I just screwed up your relationship, but I saved your life. You're welcome. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of life. Some of you guys have been dealing with you about doing something and you just haven't done it. Maybe it's starting a, starting a business. Maybe it's, you know, hosting a, a house group for neighborhood church. Maybe it's giving something away to somebody and, and God's placed this in your heart and in your spirit and you've just said, no, I'm not. And maybe it's about beginning to, to put your money where your mouth is and, and to begin to support God's work through his church. And whatever it is, there's been no fear of God there to compel you to act. And out of obedience and surrender and a love and a fear of God, you're going to step out in obedience. What is the fear of God? It's this ongoing posturing of our hearts that moves us to continually over and over again obey Him and do the right thing, even when we want to do something different. It's the fear of God. Would you stand with me this morning? God, we thank you this morning that the fear of God is the the beginning of all wisdom. 
that the fear of the Lord is the fountain of life. I want to ask God to do something within us this morning. That's to put a, a healthy, deep, reverent, respectful fear of Him back into our hearts. The kind of fear of God that because, of, because He is a holy God, because He is a righteous God, because of what he's done for you and for me. That it will guard our tongues. It will guard the things that come out of our mouths. It will restrain us. That it will propel us to walk and to act and surrender and complete obedience when God speaks to us about things. That God will just reignite and establish a healthy, deep respect in fear of him in our lives. God, I fear you today, not because I have to, but because I get to. Because you are that good that the fear of God leads to the obedience of God, and the obedience of God leads to the blessings and the favor of God in our lives. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, we ask that in your presence you would do a work within our church, God, that you would do a work in every single one of our hearts today, that we would leave here different today, that by your Holy Spirit and the teaching of your word, that you would lead us to become fully devoted, fully, completely committed followers of Jesus. God, let the fear of God fill our hearts today with, with reverence and respect and honor and out of, out of, out of uh, an attempt to love you back the way that you've loved us, God. We will respect you. We will honor you. And we will fear you, God. And we will live with restraint in our lives. We will live compelled to walk in obedience to you because we love you, because we get to love you back. Thank you for what you've done for each and every one of us today, Lord. God, may we leave this place different today. May we leave this place today with a healthy fear of God Almighty today who loves us more than anything, more than anything. He gave His only Son to die for our sins. And because of that, our only reasonable response is to live fully committed to Him. In Jesus' name, do the work that needs to take place in our hearts right now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit just continues to minister, would you just, would you lift your voice in worship and worship Him today?
Say this with me. Say, God is good. Ready? God is good, and I get to serve Him. And I get to serve Him. I get to serve Him. Are you glad to be in God's house today? Man, let's never take for granted this, this privilege that we have in this country to, to still get to come and to worship Him together. I just want to bless you as you go this morning. Two quick reminders. First is this. Buy a tree, change your life. Wow, <laughs> love it. It's just around the corner, just around the corner. Here's, you'll hear more about that from, in the weeks to come. Um, here's what we need you to do now to help us. If you know someone who owns a business or you, you have a relationship with someone, maybe you work for someone who, who you have a good, a good relationship with, um, let's begin even now to rattle those bushes Go to every business in town that you know of, that you're connected to or you're not connected to, um, and let's, let's work on building our sponsorship. We believe this year, last year, matter of fact, every year has been the best year yet for Buy a Tree Change of Life, and, and we just believe this year is going to be, again, the best year ever. So a lot of that has to do with sponsors who, who believe in the cause and want to help, want to contribute to it. So help us out by going and helping us rally up some sponsors. Um, if you know of somebody, come see me. Uh, Sam, raise your hand. Craig, raise your hand back here. Michael, raise your hand back here. See any of these guys on the, on the lead team for Buy a Tree Change Your Life or myself. Um, if you know a sponsor, man, we'll get them signed up. Um, second thing is this. See you today at 5 o'clock. Bring a lawn chair. Bring a dessert. Come join us. Hamburgers, hot dogs, we'll provide everything else, all that. Come out. It's going to be a great time to hang out with God's people. Uh, bring a friend with you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.